If you're vegan, you're plant-based, or you're considering just reducing your consumption of animal products, here's how to modify your diet to maximize muscle growth and stay healthy. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching, non-functioning sign, or maybe I'm just trying to save electricity. I recently got an electric bill worth several thousand dollars, so we're trying to save over here. Turns out, streaming Pornhub on 14 different screens at once take some electric. And since we're talking about the environment, let me make clear what this video is and isn't. I am not advocating for or against vegan diets or omnivorous diets or what have you. I am just going to be presenting the science on how to maximize muscle building and stay healthy if you do choose to opt to eat more plant-based. And I'm not going to comment on the ethics or the environmental impact because, frankly, not my area of expertise. What I will say, though, is that health-wise, a well-constructed vegan or plant-based diet can be just as healthy as a well-constructed omnivorous diet. There are risk factors to consider with both approaches, but if you're smart about it, you can be just as healthy and gain just as much muscle with either approach. Because eating plant-based involves the restriction of certain foods within your diet, that means we're potentially at the risk of missing out on certain important nutrients. But we first need to figure out what they are before we can go about how to address those issues. Fortunately, that's where a study from a couple of years ago comes in. In this study, they randomly assigned around 140 adults to one of three groups. Group one consumed 70% of their protein from animal sources and only 30% from plant sources. Group two had an even split of 50% of their protein from animal sources and the remainder from plant sources. And group three consumed 70% of their protein from plant sources and only 30% from animal sources. The authors wanted to see whether any differences in nutrient intake and potential deficiencies would arise as a consequence of shifting your protein intake from more animal sources to more plant-based sources. First, let's touch on protein and fiber. The group that consumed the most plant-based protein ended up consuming less overall protein compared to the other groups. Likewise, the group that consumed 70% of their protein from plant sources ended up consuming more fiber than the other two groups. Generally, the group consuming more of their protein from plant-based sources consumed less of these nutrients. Vitamin B12, iodine intake, zinc intake, and animal-derived iron intake. As you might expect though, the group consuming the most plant-based protein had a higher total iron intake and a higher plant-derived iron intake. And importantly, while these differences were noted in their actual nutritional intake, when it came to blood biomarkers of deficiencies in these nutrients, only a couple were significant. One of them was for vitamin B12, being lower in the plant-based groups, and the other was for urinary iodine, suggesting that even in the relatively small time frame of this study, consuming less of these nutrients within your diet seemed to lead to potential deficiencies. Importantly, while only these two markers became significantly lower over the time frame of the study, the lower nutrient intake in the plant-based groups could very feasibly lead to deficiency over the long term. And so all the nutrients I mentioned are things we need to look out for when we're eating plant-based. Another review paper on the topic from 2015, if I recall correctly, also summarized the data on this topic and found similar conclusions. Let me list the nutrients that might be worth considering if you're plant-based. Iron, vitamin B12, vitamin D, iodine, zinc, calcium, and omega-3s are likely all worth considering if you're plant-based. Now, what's the best way to address these potential deficiencies within your nutrient intake if you're heavily plant-based or even vegan? Well, a good vegan-based multivitamin can actually cover many of your bases. Multivitamins are very cheap, and while much of the evidence on multivitamins doesn't find a health benefit, that is likely because most people eating an omnivore diet that is reasonably balanced don't need a multivitamin to be in their best health. However, when you're restricting your dietary intake, that is when they become potentially more helpful. So look for a vegan multivitamin that offers around your RDA for most of the nutrients I just mentioned, and that will cover you very well. It's a cost-effective solution to minimizing the likelihood of any nutrient deficiencies within your diet as a vegan. Similarly, I would recommend consider supplementation with an omega-3 algae-based supplement. Around 1 to 2 grams of EPA and DHA combined per day is likely a great starting point. As I mentioned earlier, it seems like when you eat plant-based, your protein intake tends to go down naturally. Additionally, a common claim being made is that plant-based protein sources are far less anabolic than animal-based protein sources, and therefore you'd consume more protein as a vegan or someone who's plant-based. So what does the evidence say about whether or not plant-based people need more protein? Well, we have a few categories of evidence. First, we have cross-sectional evidence where we just look at what vegan populations versus omnivore populations tend to consume. And what these studies tell us is that people who are plant-based generally consume less protein than omnivores. And so we at least want to be mindful of our protein intake if we're plant-based. So instead, let's turn our attention to experimental studies that try to determine whether or not 
plant-based protein sources are actually less anabolic and worse for muscle growth than animal-based protein sources. First, we have a study looking at the effect of consuming 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, stemming either from an omnivorous diet or from purely a plant-based diet. In this study, participants performed single leg leg extensions so that researchers could assess the effects of different protein sources on both the anabolic response at rest in the leg that wasn't being trained and on the anabolic response after training in the leg that just performed leg extensions. And in this study, with a relatively high protein intake above the 1.6 grams of protein protein per kilogram of body weight per day recommendation from the most recent meta-regression on the topic of Morton and colleagues, when protein intake was quite high, they observed similar anabolism and potential acute effects on hypertrophy of plant-based protein versus animal-based protein. So at least in this context, with relatively high protein intakes, it didn't seem like plant-based protein sources reduced acute anabolism, either at rest or in response to resistance training session. And the data of different protein sources, plant versus animal, on acute anabolism was synthesized in a review paper by Van Vliet and colleagues. Here's roughly what they had to say. While some studies do find lower acute anabolic responses when consuming the same amount of plant-based protein versus animal-based protein, there are a few things we can do to maximize the anabolic response to plant-based proteins. Generally, plant-based proteins are thought to be less anabolic and worse for hypertrophy on account of three different factors. One, insufficient amounts of key amino acids like leucine. Two, a relatively incomplete amino acid profile, wherein the plant-based protein source has sufficient amounts of certain amino acids, but insufficient amounts of other amino acids. And three, lower digestibility of plant-based proteins. The strategies identified in this review paper were to one, seek out protein sources that are higher in certain key amino acids, two, fortifying foods with these amino acids, or three, just consuming a bit more of the plant-based protein sources to make up for some of their potential shortcomings. Importantly though, even acute anabolic responses like myofibrillar protein synthesis aren't perfectly representative of a hypertrophy over the long term. And so the tier one evidence in any question around muscle growth is always going to be a randomized controlled trial measuring the actual outcome of interest. In this case, hypertrophy over several weeks and months. There are three studies I would like to mention in this context. First, we have a study where 19 vegans and 19 omnivores were given protein powders to get up to a daily protein intake of 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. For the vegans, of course, that protein was soy-based, whereas for the omnivores, that protein was whey-based. So both groups consumed whole foods but got additional protein powder that was either vegan or soy-based, or animal-based, aka whey-based. Not only did they do this, but they also performed two days of resistance training, aka lifting weights, for their quads per week. And when consuming a pretty robust amount of protein per day in both groups, they observed very similar increases in lower body, leg lean mass, quadriceps cross-sectional area, and leg press 1 rep max. So based on this study, both for size and strength, as long as total daily protein was sufficient, it didn't seem to play a role whether participants were getting their protein from soy or from whey, or from more plant-based sources versus more animal sources. Another study compared the effects of pea protein and whey protein supplementation alongside a resistance training program on hypertrophy. And by and large, gains were very similar between groups yet again. Importantly, from the research, both pea protein and soy protein seem to be very anabolic, perhaps not quite to the same extent as whey protein, but quite similar. And finally, we have a study looking at the effects of consuming meat alternatives, you've seen fake meat in your supermarket in all likelihood, on hypertrophy. They had three groups that were aiming for a similar protein intake. In group one, a plant-based whole food diet was adopted. In group two, a plant-based diet was adopted with the inclusion of alternative meats. And in group three, an omnivorous diet was consumed. As far as gains in hypertrophy and performance went, gains were very similar between groups. There were differences in their nutrient intakes though, and importantly, diet satisfaction was higher in the whole foods plant-based diet group compared to the alternative meat group. But this study suggests that alternative meats categorically aren't a bad idea when it comes to hypertrophy and strength. So by and large, provided sufficient protein is being consumed, it seems like you can still make great gains even when you're consuming plant-based proteins as opposed to animal-based proteins. If you're plant-based and you want to maximize your muscle growth, my recommendation is to one, one, mostly look for good protein sources like soy-based protein or pea-based protein, and two, maybe increase protein intake slightly to 1.8 or 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. If you're doing this, I personally think you're almost certainly maximizing hypertrophy. So we've addressed micronutrient intake via multivitamins, we've discussed omega-3 intake via consuming additional omega-3s, we've discussed protein intake 
But there are a couple of other things you probably want to be aware of if you're plant-based. The first one is creatine. Creatine has been extensively studied within sports science and has been found to be beneficial for hypertrophy, strength, power outcomes, and more. Supplementing with creatine is a good idea whether you're omnivorous or whether you're plant-based, but it probably becomes even more beneficial when you're plant-based. While it isn't enough creatine to circumvent the need for supplementation altogether, Omnivorous diets do get you some creatine through the consumption of things like meat. And so, if you're plant-based and you're no longer consuming some of these animal products that also contain creatine, you very likely want to consider supplementation. You probably don't need to take more than anyone else. Three to five grams per day is great. Or, if you're a baller and a hustler, you know, you rent out a chainsaw and you go to your auntie's house and you start making some buck. I got $40 to my name and I'm trying to make $1,000 this weekend. They rent them chainsaws for $22 for Two hours. Boy, you better go get the chainsaw. Go pull up to your auntie house. That tree that's been leaning over on her porch. That's leaning on her car. Cut that down. Go in the backyard. Cut that other one down. She gonna give you whatever she give you. Pull off on her. You already know. You can even go with a recommendation by Darren Kandau, creatine researcher, of 0.1 grams of creatine per day per kilogram of body weight. For me, I weigh around 100 kilograms or 220 pounds right now. That would be around 10 grams of creatine per day. And no, you probably don't need to worry about a loading phase. I can make a whole video on creatine if you want, but the topic has been discussed to death, so I just haven't gotten around to it. Just like with creatine, research has also found lower levels of muscle carnosine in plant-based populations versus omnivores. Importantly, muscle carnosine is thought to be relatively important for overall performance. Now, it's likely mostly beneficial for performance of slightly longer tasks than you would typically perform in resistance training, generally over 60 seconds, but it's still worth considering, given that people eating a plant-based diet will have lower levels of muscle carnosine. Beta-alanine is a precursor to muscle carnosine, and so by supplementing with additional beta-alanine, you may make up for this reduction in beta-alanine content from your diet. I don't think it's as important as for creatine, but I think it's worth considering. There's one more consideration I have to give out for anyone eating plant-based, and that is that it can present both challenges for bulking, but also for cutting. First, just eating plant-based tends to reduce energy intake and body weight in most populations. And that likely has to do with the fact plant-based foods are generally more satiating or more hunger suppressing than most omnivore foods. There's a couple of reasons for this. First, plant-based foods generally have a higher fiber content. And secondly, they generally offer you more volume per calorie consumed. They have a lower energy density. I have a whole video on hunger suppressing foods up somewhere above, but generally these factors will make a food more satiating. And if you're trying to gain weight and consume more calories, this can be difficult. So if you're facing this challenge, try to find foods with a higher energy density, potentially a lower fiber content, and generally are just more palatable or pleasurable to eat. But even more tricky than bulking is cutting, and specifically contest prep can be very difficult for someone eating predominantly or exclusively plant-based foods. While eating plant-based diets can be great for satiation and managing hunger, it is more difficult to get protein in on a low calorie budget. Plant-based protein sources generally fall into one of two categories. The first category is protein sources that are not very satiating, but are high in protein and low in calories. And this would mostly be things like soy protein isolate powder. While you get a lot of protein per calorie here, it doesn't really offer satiation, and you probably don't want to get all of your protein in every day from a protein powder. The second category are protein sources that have some protein, but also generally just have way higher calories, which when you're on a cut or when you're cutting for a show, can be very challenging to navigate. For instance, tofu falls into this category. While it does have some high quality protein, it also has a fair amount of calories compared to most lean protein sources if you were consuming an omnivore diet. And so if you're cutting or you're cutting for a show specifically, just be aware that as the diet gets harder and harder and your calorie budget lessens, you may need to rely more and more on protein powders. Or alternatively, you may have to increase activity more so that you can consume more calories and still lose weight and have the budget for some of those protein sources like tofu. That is the video. I broke down all the science on protein intake, muscle growth as a plant-based athlete, on health, micronutrients, creatine, beta-alanine. I covered all the science I could find on how to eat plant-based and still make great gains in terms of muscle size.
and in terms of health. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, subscribe. If you're looking for a training app to handle all of your training for you that is coming out soon, check out myadapt.com. The pitch for myadapt is that it's supposed to be like a coach in your pocket at a fraction of the price of an actual coach. And so if you'd like to be notified when it does get released and potentially lock in for a lower price than any other time, check out myodup.com and sign up to be notified when it does get released. What's that? You like this t-shirt, this t-shirt of Atlas that is looking quite fly, if I do say so myself. Well, you can find that on rascalapparel.com. Honestly, my favorite training clothing I've ever worn as far as design, durability, and comfort while training. So go check it out and you might find something you like. If you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and I can become your coach. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and I will see you guys in that next one. Peace.